Uh, welcome to the Toronto premiere of uh, MS Slavic 7 and uh, Eki I Ala. Um, my name is Kajik Radvinsky and I'm one of the co-founders of MDFF. Uh, to begin, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. Uh, we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, and our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and the TIFF Cinematex public supporters, the Ontario Media Development Corporation, and the Canada Council for the Arts. As a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming and educational and community outreach initiatives possible. So uh, tonight, uh, we have the pleasure of having three filmmakers in attendance. Um, three very prolific Toronto filmmakers. So I'll, I'll start just by intro introducing them all. Um, Sophia Bogdanovitz. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sophia uh, won um, the Emerging Canadian Director Award at the 2016 Vancouver International Film Festival for her debut feature, Never Eat Alone. Uh, in 2017, uh, Sophia won the J. Scott Prize, uh, awarded by the TFCA, and had a retrospective of her work at Bifisi. Um Her second feature, Maison de Bonheur, uh, was awarded Best Canadian Documentary by the Vancouver Critics uh, Circle and was nominated for Best Canadian Film of the Year by the TFCA. Uh, MS Slavic 7 is her third feature, um, but she's also a prolific short filmmaker. Uh, we screened two of her shorts earlier this year, uh, Where and uh, The Soft Space. Uh, MS Slavic 7 is co-directed by Dara Campbell, who is a, a local um, filmmaker and actor. Um, her performance credits include uh, lead roles in It Used to Be Darker by Matt Porterfield, Stinking Heaven uh, by Nathan Silver, which we screened back when we were doing uh, screenings at the Royal um, back in 2017, um, and Fail to Appear, another MDFF presentation directed by Antoine Bourges. Um, she's received uh, writing credits on a number of her acting projects, including my own film, uh, and at 13,000 feet. And uh, she's been selected for Rising Star by Tith and the Artist Academy at the New York Film Festival. Um, Sophia and Dara have collaborated on a number of times, um, with Dara appearing as the character of Audrey Banak, um, an amateur family historian, um, who appeared in Sophia's previous uh, short film, Vessel Moy Song, and her first feature, uh, Never Eat Alone. Um, MS Slavic 7 is the first time that they've shared a directing credit. Um, in MS Slavic 7, um, Audrey is now researching her great-grandmother's letters uh, from the 1950s and 60s. Uh, letters written to the famed Polish poet Joseph uh, Whitlin. Um, MS Slavic 7 is the reference code, um, the actual real-life uh, reference code um, housed in the archives of Harvard's Houghton Library. Also, Audrey's great-grandmother, Zofia Bogdanovich Zova. Uh, I'm Polish, too, and I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, uh, it's actually uh, Sofia's real-life grandmother, uh, great-grandmother. So, um, that, and that's just one of the many ways in which um, the filmmakers, Sofia and Dara, play with this notion of authenticity, uh, who is allowed to, to tell which kinds of stories and um, I'm sure there'll be plenty more to talk about in the Q&A. Um, tonight, we're also joined by Lena Rodriguez, uh, who made Aki Iela. Um, Lena is a Colombian-Canadian director. She's written and directed and produced uh, six short films and two feature films, which have been showcased around the world at Locarno, TIFF, New York Film Festival, Mar, Mar del Plata, and also at the Harvard Film Archives. Um, both of her features have screened theatrically here at the Lightbox, and also earlier this year, we screened a short by Lena Ante Mi Hoyos. Uh, we're thrilled to be screening the Toronto premiere of Lena's latest work, Aki Iela. Um, it's a poetic reflection on family as an emotional system that operates across generations. Um, it juxtaposes uh, color 16 millimeter film, black and white, uh, mini DV footage, and photos from the filmmaker's um, family archive. So, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming um, Sophia, Dara, and Lena. Uh, 
Uh, hi, everybody. We're so happy to be here at our local Cinematheque and uh, seeing so many friends in the audience. Um, this is a film that Sophia and I made uh, together um, in a very uh, consistent dialogue. Um, when Sophia discovered um, these letters were in an archive at Harvard, we once again <clears throat> utilized this character, Audrey Banak, who has sort of sort of began as a stand-in for Sophia, um, but has since sort of become a vehicle through which we can examine her family history further, um, but also channel our own anxieties. And, you know, she also kind of has a life a bit independent from us as well. Um, so yeah, this film was made in Toronto and with uh, the support of a lot of people in Toronto. It was workshopped with a lot of uh, Toronto filmmakers I see in the audience that really shaped what the film became. Uh, so we're really, yeah, we're really including Lena, <laughs> Grace. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so we're um, we're really happy uh, to be showing it here tonight. And Sophia is going to go on and uh, thank people more specifically. Yeah, we just want to name all of our pals that helped uh, us make this happen. We are indebted to you, I think. Um, part of the film was actually shot here in the Tiff Bell Lightbox. So we were trying to stage Harvard and we were looking for a reception area. Um, and they let us shoot here in the summer when the uh, reference library was closed down. So we wanted to thank Michelle Lovegrove Thompson, Kate Watson, and Lena Rodriguez for generously coordinating this for us. Um, and we're really thrilled that we get to bring it back here and screen it here in this building. Um, we wanted to thank Dan and Kaz for being amazing distributors for our release this week. We're so grateful. Um, our brilliant publicist, Sam Chater, without her, you wouldn't be here tonight. We love Sam. Um, the TIFF Cinematech team, so Amanda Brayson, Lydia Aguan, and Brad Dean, as well as the TIFF new release team, Lauren Zavitz, Ming Jen Lim, Charlotte Vincer, Caitlin Garvey, um, and also the amazing TIFF social team, that is Sasha and Andrew. Um, we're grateful to the Ekron Film Festival for promoting the release as well. Um, our brilliant producer Calvin Thomas is here. I don't know where you are, Calvin. We love you. I love you. Um, <laughs> um, we're so glad that we have two very talented, amazing actors who are in the film here tonight. And those people are Liz Rucker. I don't know where you are, Liz, but I'm so glad you're here. As well as Aaron Danby. Um, they're here tonight and they're going to join us for a Q&A. So please stick around for that. Um, thank you, Annie, for your overhead projector, wherever you are. Um, we're really thrilled uh, with this programming choice um, that actually stems from Adam Cook's Future Present program. Um, we're really, really, really thrilled to be screening MS Slavic 7 with Lina Rodriguez's film uh, Aki Iala. Uh, we're really, really, really happy that both the Bogdanovich and Rodriguez families are going to meet on screen tonight. Both of our films kind of concern, I guess, echoes um, and weight of family history. And we're so, so thrilled to be screening with this beautiful film so thank you wow um well first i wanted to thank uh dan and Cass for this incredible space that is mdff i think it's sort of like changed and transformed the uh, toronto film scene and it's a place where we get to meet and exchange and learn from each other so thank you for that space that you've created for so long um i'm super excited to be sharing the stage with these two talented and intelligent women who are also pushing the boundaries of what Canadian cinema can be. Uh, for someone as myself who's an immigrant, I think to just see boundaries be expanded to what Canadian cinema, the possibilities of it, it's, it's really exciting and it's a really exciting time. So I'm really, really excited to be showing the film with them today. I haven't seen the both films on screen, so I'm really excited to, to watch the films and uh, just think about the echoes of, of one film from the other, and as Sophia was saying, both films are concerned with uh, memory and uh, the passing of time and family archives, so I'm really excited to talk about that with all of you after. I would like to thank uh, my partner Brad, whose support through my whole filmmaking wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without him. I would like to thank my friend Craig, who's uh, done the design for all of my films, like all of the materials of my films, and he did the design for this film as well. And um, just briefly about my film, um, I guess in a way I made the film as a way to try to connect with uh, my family's history, but then when you start thinking about history, you, you, ha you have to think about this journey to the past. So in the film, 
you will see this sort of um, relationship between the past and the present and the film intentionally draws a, a blurry line between the past and the present. And uh, I invite you and I encourage you to think about uh, how I use uh, 16 millimeter color as Kaz was saying and mini DV black and white and how these two formats uh, relate to each other and echo to each other, echo with each other to think about the possibilities of uh, tracing the past. I mean, the past is not a place that we can go or visit to just get a clear idea of what things were like. So this is why the film, it's kind of oscillating between the past and the present. So I'm looking forward to chatting with you here or after in the Bell Blue Room. I can say that, right? Yeah, in the Bell Blue Room after, uh, where we can chat more one-on-one -on -one, uh, with drinks. And you can ask me whatever you want. And I'm really excited to also watch the film and just get to just see more of the echoes of our films together. It's a really special night. I wish my parents were here and I want to say one more thing. I mean, they're not here. And it's just part of my life when uh, I'm probably going to cry. But just like having um, a film screen without my family. But my dad, uh, it was a close collaborator in this film uh, in front and behind the camera. And my mother did sound um recording so i wish they were here but they're obviously i owe them a huge thank you for being not only my parents but they're actually collaborators in the film my dad is a co-producer as well so thank you so much and have a great screening and uh we would love to invite the wonderful aaron danby and liz rucker to come on stage as well And while they're coming up, I just wanted to point out that our incredible mixer, Matt Chen, is here tonight. He took a lot of raw audio and did a lot of magical things. So thank you, Matt, wherever you are. And uh, there's also Ken Tudo, who's here tonight, who helped us during production. Thank you so much, Ken. Hey, there you are. Hey. Thanks, Ken. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure that the audience has a lot of questions, but uh, maybe we could start, I mean, with both films, of talking about the, um, obviously, family and histories, but the, the specific origins or the starting points of each film. Yeah, um, so I was Googling um, my great-grandmother's name. Um, I had made several short films based on her poetry and was looking for more meat, I guess, or just like, I wanted to learn more about her biography. And I came across these letters in um, an archive at Harvard at Houghton Library. And I was kind of pinching myself when I found them. I was like, really, Harvard? What are these letters? What could they be? And there was 25 of them. And they were written to Joseph Vitlin. Um, and I knew the poem very well that you saw at the beginning of the film that kind of described this like intense encounter in Toronto and High Park. And I was like, are they love letters? What are they? So I bought them from Houghton Library, had them scanned, then they were translated by the Polish consulate here in Toronto and I was really excited by the translations because they were in fact you know what I feel are kind of like love letters or letters of admiration and I talked to Dara about it who's a very close collaborator and I was like I can't believe this I, we need to do something with this and then Dara disappeared and she came back to me <laughs> You had a long think and, and pitched this amazing structure to me. And I remember you were really excited about it. And you pitched this structure about a young woman who would um, pour over these letters in an archive over the course of three days. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah. So she pitched this structure and then we shot it in about seven days. So that's that's how it started. You have one. Oh, another. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, I was first interested in trying to go back to the 50s because my fa my grandfather was a truck driver and in the 50s there was this time of called like the violence in Colombia. So I wanted to try to track the echoes of violence through the town and because my grandfather used to tell all these stories when I was growing up. My, my, both my grandmother and my grandfather have passed away. So when I went to do preliminary interviews, I started talking to my dad and then my dad took me to the town, which I had been at before and I had actually spent time there with my grandparents. And then he took me around the town and then the house, which I knew. And then he just started kind of like talking about their childhood together. And then I realized that a lot of the violence that I thought had happened in the town had happened outside of the town. And then I just, and then I just realized that really what I was trying to do was probably trying to find ways to connect to this family history. And although the violent kind of like bigger picture of, of the country, something that interests me, I, th I felt like the film that I was trying to make without knowing. It was a very process-driven thing, so this was just the beginning. It was really more about family, so then 
I started thinking about just making a film about like my dad and his siblings and then the house where they grew up was sold and that was kind of like the last connection to the town so I felt that that was a I guess like a great excuse to try to go and document this house, which, uh, I mean, other people live there now, so it, it was just trying to find a way to just, I, I love this um, moment in Emma Slavic 7 where, uh, where Audrey's talking about grasping, and I was thinking about this gesture that perhaps as filmmakers we make in general, but it's about like grasping something, and I, and I guess I think that's what happened. I think I realized that it was a time for me to try to grasp something through an archive that in a sense is a house, right? And, and a house and a space perhaps is not like a traditional archive that you would see in a place, but it, bec it it's like an archive of all of these different layers of history. So I realized that that was what I had to do and just kind of like shifted the film to, to be more personal and uh, focus on my family and then ask my dad to collaborate. And anyway, there, there came like this whole process of collaborating with my dad where he uh, developed questions to interview his siblings and then and I can talk more about the formats and stuff, but I, I anyway. But that's kind of like how it it was sort of about the town, and then it became more about family, and then I guess my search for this connection with the past and the impossibility of grasping the past. I guess. Yeah, I, I think both films there's sort of multiple or sort of multiple stories or broken stories or fragments of stories. I think it's really interesting in your film, Lena, how the stories sort of appear silently over over black screens. And then similarly, I mean, it happens in multiple ways in Emma Slavic with the subtitles appearing as Dara's sort of going, or Audrey's going through. I wonder if you could talk about that a bit, sort of the nature of archives and histories and how you decided to um, display them. Should I start? Okay, you want me? <laughs> um, yeah, originally we had this idea that we would sort of deconstruct the letters and have these silent segments of viewing the letters and then you would learn about the letters through Audrey's understanding of them and then at the end you would have this final recital and a more direct um, contact with the letters. Um, but as we were sort of doing... Uh, note sessions um, with uh, some different filmmakers in Toronto. Um, one of, we, we started kind of talking about the narrative of the letters and people sort of pointed out to us uh, that the narrative was absent or that, or that it was withheld for a very long time. So we tried to find, because the, the letters were so rich, we did try and find a way to insert them throughout um, and so that's kind of how the, the subtitles came about. Um, and, and I think it, it funnily enough ended up having all these different implications or, or it ended up connecting with our original intentions in different ways where for me, like the monologues are so much about reading and about kind of the emotional experience of reading and connecting it to other things that you've you've read and that kind of uh, feeling you get when you're you're close to understanding something, but you're also a little bit frustrated because you haven't quite got there yet. Um, so the subtitles, I think, mean that you you have to read in so many different ways throughout the film, and that you have texts that are filmed that we filmed during principal shooting, and then you have texts that we inserted during editing, so there are all these different interventions, these different times that you see us inserting texts as well. Um, I've really gone away from the original question. <laughs> no, but <laughs> um, What was the original question? No, you, you <laughs> totally got it. It was about the, the subtitles and how that came yeah. about. And it, yeah, no, you're, you're totally on it. And um, I think part of your original pitch was to explore these um, letters as artifacts in three different ways. So the first one was to look at like the letters as physical objects. Like how do they sound? How do, how do they feel in your hands? And I did like a lot of foleying with these letters um, in post-production so you could kind of like feel how delicate they were. And I think Matt did like a very good job of embodying that in the 
the mix. So the first one was, you know, the letter as an object. Second one is like the erratic qualities of a letter, the spirit of the letter. Um, so those subtitles being there at the beginning, you know, Audrey doesn't speak Polish, but what we were wondering is like, does the weight of, you know, the history of her family still exist and does that still impact her here and now, um, despite the fact that she can't exactly understand what that history means. And then the third part was the content. So finally we get to see the translations of the letters um, and we're really studying what they're saying to each other. And then there's like the recital of them. And I think through the structure that you pitched, we were able, I think, to explore the letter through all of those avenues. So, yeah. Um, it's interesting, the the idea of this kind of fragmented, sort of like piecing together. And I, I guess as I was saying at the beginning, at, at least for me, my process of trying to figure out how to connect to the past, because the past is not like a place that you can go to, then you start trying to figure out how to recompose that. And it's like, I guess for me, it was trying to recompose like this series of intensities in a way, which is why the film also has, and, and I was thinking about this as I was watching the films, like there's like this interesting kind of like choral or like these kind of like multiple voices. And even if in Emma's Life like Seven, you, you, in a way you are seeing one perspective, you're seeing multiple perspectives because you see these echoes and the way that the text comes in these different ways. And one of the things when I was trying to reconstruct this family past, it was like, I wanted to speak about these spaces and what my family told me had happened there. And um, I guess for Spanish speakers, it, it, it might be a bit richer because there's all of this kind of sound work where there's like voices that speak of these other things. So it's about like these haunted spaces that have these other layers. But then at the end, then towards the end, you have like these quotations where like I'm quoting. So it's like, I guess it's, it's I guess in a way it's trying to explore who the I is and how do I, I speak of the past, but the I is contained, like I contain other eyes, I guess. I contain other parts of the family history. And uh, in my film, because I was trying to figure out how to speak of this past and what happened in these spaces and the people who are in these spaces now, which is not my family, it's one of the reasons why I chose to do 16 and uh, mini DV and try to shoot the same space. So again, it's kind of like fragmenting one space with, from two different perspectives to try to create a new space or evoke the space that was and is now. So that's why you see like the same spaces, but they're like slightly different angles from black and white and color. So I think this idea of like this, it's like a broken text, a broken image and a broken sound, trying to perhaps find a way to create a new space that is in between the both, both space and time, which is the past and the present. Uh, one more question before I open it up. Uh, perhaps for for the actors. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure Dara is quite f <laughs> familiar with Sophia's um, process, but I wonder, yeah, what it was like being sort of brought into this film with such personal subject matter. In some ways, was that present, or was it? Maybe this is a question for Sophia too, because it's sort of an evolution. Your work could be more fictional, but um, yeah, I'm curious how you approached uh, your characters. Well, sure. I mean. Um there was a lot of discussion around the nature of the ant and knowing that I was stepping into Sophia's family story and perhaps portraying some, perhaps portraying someone in her family. Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it, on one hand, it, it felt like a responsibility and a bit of a puzzle for me, you know, what, what does it mean? Then also how, what would this character be for me? And I actually look to my own family and my own aunts. I mean, I have very, kind and gregarious ants, but um, but still at the same time, they can have an edge or, you know, just observing an ant who, I don't know, sometimes will get mad at me or frustrated with my youth. I'm trying to work with that. Um, but yet, I think in all of it, there was the strong sense that this ant was absolutely mean. <laughs> like I could, I'd be like, well, you know, maybe she's having a hard time. It's like, no, oh, she's mean. <laughs> um, and that was very, I mean, I mean, I still felt for her, you know, um, like I really, I, I liked her <laughs> in some way, um, but that was, I was really, it's, 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 I mean, it's an honor in a way to step into someone's family story like that and, and wanting to get it right. So, um, yeah, that I felt very affected by the opportunity to do that. I don't know if you want to. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
Um, so I came into the film kind of last minute. Um, I think Sophia had someone else in mind to, to play the part of the, <laughs> or the librarian. Um, so I did come in really at the last moment. But um, so the approach for me was less about the family dynamic and more about the um, coming from the perspective of the the archive. Um, and so for me, I I looked at it more as um, kind of uh, venerating the the archive and like the uh, the role of the archi the archivist. I kind of um, took that on almost as being like a priest of the of the archive. Yeah, right. I was very <laughs> defensive of the, the sacredness of, of the material. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's <laughs> all I have to say. Yeah, yeah. We actually filmed the screen at Harvard a few weeks ago, and archivists were like really excited by your character and the way that like <laughs> he protected the material. One of the archivists said, "Like he's actually a hero." <laughs> <laughs> So you're very, you're very accurate on that. And yeah, I, I think you also really approached your character with like a lot of empathy. And the thing is, is that Audrey's a brat. Like she's a millennial and she doesn't have like, she, she's unable to understand, I think, the weight of like the, what the parental generation had to experience with having parents who uh, experienced the war, you know? Um, she didn't have to live through that trauma so i think that dissonance is like dissonance that can exist within the parental generation but also like anya is like a little bit of like a shadow you know when you're trying to self-actualize and you're in the midst of like creating something there's a, this voice of self-doubt that comes sure. in and that's something that we realized in the edit too that was coming through i was like oh this voice sounds familiar this is my own voice <laughs> that comes in when i'm trying to make something so i think that character's a lot of things. kind of a foil. Yeah, you brought something really special to it. You really went for it. Oh. But yeah, Audrey's not really necessarily able to see other people beyond uh, being obstacles to herself and her, her single-mindedness as well. So I, you're also seeing her kind of villainize them. I mean, there's a comedy in like how nice you guys are <laughs> compared <laughs> to true. the characters. Yeah. I found it interesting, though, just even like because the first time I've seen the film um, going like, wow, that's the arc. Um, but I find it interesting just uh, in terms of the story, how the past is kind of owned by the ancestors. And in some ways they can be like a barrier to it because the past is hard for them to bear or um, and you're you, you see the richness of it. But the pain, it's hard to get through. And that kind of tension between the generations was like present for me in both the works and really complex ways is really interesting so yeah it was sort of something i, I got <laughs> Watch it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, questions from the audience um yeah um rebecca yeah. <laughs> um first of all congratulations that was both of those pieces were so beautiful um i have a question about letters and archives um as Sophia, you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about this, but there was a time when every art, like most artists would be writing letters, exchanging letters with, with other artists. Uh, if you look at someone like Virginia Woolf, like so much, there's so much richness in those letters um, about the artist's life and the artist's thoughts, opinions, personal life, all these things. Um, today, so few artists that I know um, write handwritten letters. Uh, we all exchange um, our thoughts and planning films over email. Um, and I'm just wondering, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, I would not be at all surprised if archivists took great interest in the work that um, you're all creating. And I'm just wondering if if today, um, Sophia, Dara, and Lena, if, if you're thinking at all about um, what you will, what you are, are going to leave behind apart from your films in terms of, um, you know, pieces of writing containing your your thoughts and your opinions and your, you know, information about your personal lives and um, do you write letters? Do most of you, do you keep journals? Do you you know? Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Do you want me to start? I can start. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I don't know how interesting my Gmail is going to be in 50 years. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, we don't write letters anymore to each other and we don't really pay attention to our words. And yet I think, you know, they really, really matter, you know, the way that we interact with one another and what we say. Um, and, you know, one of one film that was a big um, inspiration for Dara and I when we were making it was um, The Dreamed Ones by Ruth Beckerman, which was um, uh, a correspondence between Paul Selen and uh, Ingeborg Bachmann, two poets. And Dara and I saw it together and we were really moved by this correspondence. And then that's when I realized, like, oh, there are these letters that exist that my great grandmother wrote to this poet. And I, you know, was very inspired um, to exhume them and to examine um, that relationship. And that was very inspiring um, to me. And um, Dara so eloquently uh, references in one of her monologues, she references um, on Kawara, who sends out those postcards that say, I got up to his friend. And I think for my great grandmother, who was a survivor of World War II, she didn't experience the Holocaust, certainly, but um, survived um, living in a camp in Siberia. I think what those letters represented for her were like markers of existence and for Joseph Vitlin as well, because he was a Holocaust survivor, too. So I think just I think the luxury to exchange those words, but also to be continuing to be making work creatively after surviving all of that was really impactful and significant. Um, and in terms of what I'm leaving behind or how I'm going to preserve that, I'm not exactly sure, you know? I think I need to get better at backing up my films. I think that's one thing I think Calvin would agree. But, I, you know, I love, I love your, your question. I think it's important to think about, you know, the tangible things that we're um, leaving behind. Um, Walter Benjamin took an archive course um, this spring and he talks about how like the erratic qualities of objects come back you know with a vengeance because we live in a digital era where we're just like living on our screens all the time but what about the things that we touch and leave behind they they make a difference but I think we're caring less and less about them or maybe as a result they become more valuable I don't know I mean I think a lot of us have very meaningful exchanges online. Maybe some of the difficulty will be in moving between these different, like constructing a narrative between the messages you might be having by email and Instagram messenger and by text and kind of that obviously many holes are made and then can kind of be uh, puzzled together, I think. But even... Um, like thinking, I was thinking about text messaging <laughs> recently and the weird way that, that a text is um, an interruption and there's a, a strange urgency where you feel you have to get back to it uh, right away. And I was joking with my friend about how I usually answer texts at like 5 p.m. Like maybe like message me at any point in the day and I'll get back to you at 5 p.m. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Um, um, but, but that somehow email actually has taken on a bit of, uh, the structure of a letter in a weird way where you can write something. I mean, it also has a very transactional quality, but you also can write these more long form thoughtful things and you kind of have a permission to not get back to someone for three to five days. I, I stretch it, but like... <laughs> But I, I think I think it's interesting to see how these mediums kind of are sort of bending toward letters in a funny way. Um, I don't really interact that. I mean, besides email, that's kind of what I do. But I was thinking about um, WhatsApp. Like, I mean, I guess out of, out of all of the sort of digital kind of ways of communication, WhatsApp has become a very specific way that I communicate with certain people. Uh, so. So in terms of like my family history, even like with, like I'm here, my parents are in Colombia, my brother's in Australia, and just this kind of like tracking the, this communication, um, I guess for me it becomes about trying to focus on, which I do in my films, kind of both the experimental work and the fiction work so far, and it's like focusing on this quotidian 
details of life, right? And that's why in some of my films, like even just looking at a kitchen and how someone lives and like the objects in a kitchen start kind of talking about these daily lives, which is, I'm not, I'm not so sure I will be remembered. I want to be remembered and I don't want to be mean to anyone else, but I think we're all going to probably fade to oblivion. And I don't know if it's about leaving a mark, but so much about trying to, um, I guess in a way like the greatest mistake is not to be present. And I think uh, just trying to be present, I suppose, and trying to leave a mark being present in whatever medium people pick. And, you know, like I'm, I'm not just not, I'm not as comfortable, I guess, in social media. And that's not really where I kind of move. But for me, I guess it's my work. Uh, I guess trying to do it in person with people. And I, I would suppose like the family group of WhatsApp with my family, it's, it's, it's a place where I'm trying to, you know, and then I totally get why people post photos of, food and Instagram, I do it with my family. And he's like, this is what I'm doing right now. But f but for me, it's about the moment. So I guess it's, it's less about a legacy and it's more about the present. Another question, yeah. A uh, question for the filmmakers. Um, I find a lot of times when people are making movies that deal with other languages, the status quo is to basically translate everything but in both films there were instances where uh, either there was content in Polish or content in Spanish that was not translated so I was wondering what the thought process was behind um, making a selection of whether it be the music or the poetry or things that people were saying uh, that weren't translated and why were they not translated Like at some point for me, uh, because there is all of this layers of voices of my, and sometimes it's about what they're saying about that space, but sometimes it's about other spaces. And I really wanted to truncate, I guess, the, or like going back to what Cass was saying about fragmentation, like really fragment the time and space because like, you know, the past is not a solid reality that we can understand. So it was, it, it's, it's not that I can translate that past, even if I know what happened or they told me what happened. So I felt that at some point I was really tempted to uh, translate some things and there's like some subtle threads. It, it's like a family tapestry at the end. There's all of these different threads and I was kind of really tempted to translate some stuff because there's some stuff about, there's like a little thread about race where like they're talking about how my grandfather was darker and there was like this racism towards him. And then at the beginning, there's like m one of my aunts who's talking about how this other aunt was really beautiful because she was white. And I was just like, oh, like people who don't speak Spanish will never get this. And I, and I tried actually to translate it and I just felt like the tag, I mean, it became commentary too. Like it became like this literal commentary into what something is. And I think ultimately what I realized is that I can't really translate this past. So I'm always going to be missing something. And it's a, it's a, it's an incomplete fragmented and sort of like broken tapestry that I'm trying to put together, but there's no way that it'll be precise and solid. So I just, I, I felt that it was better to have these multiple textures and these different ways to connect to things through like image, sound, uh, words and text and to just have that come together and fall apart. And then whoever was following whichever part would have different understandings. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for more, for more questions. No, no, this has been an, uh, an incredible Q&A. The, the, the upside is that we can now go for drinks and talk more. Um, but yeah, please join me thanking once again, Sophia, Dara, and Lena. Thank you, Kaz, for Thanks, having Kaz. us. Thanks. You're the best. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you all for yeah, coming. And we'll, we'll be just upstairs, uh, Bell Blue Room. Just